On Monday of this past week, we, as a nation, observed the 22nd anniversary of a very sad day in our history. And I'm speaking about the events of 9-11-2001. That was the day, as you no doubt know, that Islamic terrorists commandeer four, four commercial jets filled with passengers to carry out a suicide mission, namely to bring down the Twin Towers at the World Trade Center in New York City, and also to attack the Pentagon and the U.S. Capitol. Unfortunately, only one of the four planes failed to carry out its mission. That was the one that was destined to destroy the Capitol. Passengers on that plane, United Flight 93, overpowered the hijackers. And the plane ultimately crashed into a vacant field 20 minutes outside of Washington, D.C., killing everyone on board. All told that day, 3,000 innocent people lost their lives in the coordinated attacks of that day. And 9-11 has gone down in history as the deadliest and the most daring foreign attack which has ever taken place on U.S. soil. I don't know about you, but I will never forget that day. It was a Tuesday morning. It was a picture-perfect day in New York City. I was pastor at that time at Our Lady of Mercy Church in Baton Rouge, and I was preparing to celebrate the 8 a.m. Mass when I got a very worried phone call from my mother who told me to turn on the TV. That morning, it didn't really matter what channel you tuned into. All of the networks had their live feed trained on the Twin Towers in downtown Manhattan in New York. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The Twin Towers were clearly under attack by commercial jetliners, which seemed impossible. They had already crashed into them. My mother reminded me that my youngest sister was already at work that day at the World Trade Center in the 47th Tower, a floor of Tower Number 2, the 47th floor. The priest, who was my assistant, agreed to take my mass, and I hurried over to my parents' house. And we watched helplessly as first one building and then the other came tumbling down. We had no way of knowing what had happened to my sister, whether she was alive or dead. Later on, we would learn that when my sister heard aloud what seemed to be an explosion, and then she saw thousands of sheets of paper floating through the clear Manhattan skies from Tower Number One, she knew something was very wrong, and she ran for the stairs, urging her friends in her office to go there as well. As people ran out of the building in order to escape what was happening, an announcement came on throughout the building, and it urged everyone to turn around, to go back to their offices, that everything was under control. My sister kept running because she had been in that building back in 1993, when Islamic terrorists had also detonated a bomb. And she had gotten out safely that day, and she wasn't about to turn back. As it turned out, she had just made it outside of the building when tower number one came down. All of a sudden, a cloud of dense smoke that was filled with debris and toxic chemicals filled the air. Those like my sister who were enveloped in that cloud could not see who was next to them, what was in front of them. They could barely breathe. But they kept on running until they emerged from the cloud. It would be three long hours before my family and I would learn that my sister was safe and sound. Now, the reason that I recount that story to you is not simply to relive a dark day in American history, but rather to illustrate 
the truth and the meaning of the parable that our Lord tells us in the gospel today. But in order to do that, I have to add something to the story first, something that took place on the very first anniversary of 9-11. As that first anniversary drew near, I decided that I would go to New York City in order to celebrate at the special mass which was taking place that evening at St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue. Needless to say, the liturgy was very solemn and moving. The cathedral was packed with hundreds and hundreds of people from every faith and from all walks of life. There were dignitaries present from all over the world. At the end of the mass, Cardinal Edward Egan, who was the Archbishop of New York at that time, drew everyone's attention to a woman who was seated in the first row of the church. In her arms, she was holding a four-month-old child, her child. And then he pointed to four young boys, ages 8 to 13, who were seated in the sanctuary of the church. They were dressed in cassock and surplice because they had just served the Mass. Those four boys were all brothers. They were the sons of the woman in the first pew. And that infant was their baby brother. Tragically, the father of those boys was not at the Mass at St. Patrick's that day. He had died exactly one year before. He was one of the firefighters who, like so many other rescue workers at the risk of their lives, responded to the tragedy at the World Trade Center. He sacrificed his life in order that others might live. A father of four, dying prematurely because of a senseless act of hatred and violence. And a pregnant widow who was forced to mourn her beloved husband and to raise her four sons alone as she awaited the birth of their fifth and final son. Cardinal Egan asked one of the firefighters who was present to lift that baby up high so that everyone in the cathedral could see him. And it was far and away the most emotional moment in that liturgy, a moment when tears of sadness turned to hope and even to joy. The entire cathedral rose as one to its feet, and then a great ovation went up among the crowd. A second ago, I said that hope is what filled our hearts at that moment. But there have been many times since then that I've thought back to that day and I've asked myself, what exactly were we hoping for? Indeed, what was our hope for that widowed mother and for her five sons? Did we hope to see those boys raised in a home that was filled with hatred or bitterness or anger to grow up in an atmosphere of unforgiveness and thirst for revenge? Did we want to see those five boys who are young men in their 20s and 30s now live long enough to avenge the death of their fathers? You know, there are many cultures throughout the world that espouse a value in which that would seem the honorable, the right thing to do, where anger is nourished and nurtured and held onto, as we heard in our first reading today. Or was our hope at St. Patrick's Cathedral that day not for something very different, namely that those five boys would grow up to know the living God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who at the moment of his death called out to his heavenly Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The good news 
is that God has forgiven us through Jesus Christ. God offers us the gift of reconciliation with him through his son. Will we forgive our fellow servants too?